Nilifer Merchant is the best-selling author of 11 Rules for Creating Value in the Social Era, and that's in the hashtag social era. As an author on innovation and collaboration, a TED speaker, and a business leader with 20 years of experience, Nilifer challenges audiences just like you to do more than just think differently. She asks you to act differently, and she knows how to close the gap between strategy and execution which of course is a key to operationalizing technology. Nilifer's experience ranges from working with Steve Jobs at Apple in the defeat of Microsoft in that epic industry battle, to advising the C-suites of GE, IBM, Logitech, and more. Corporations like Symantec, Yahoo, Google, and many, many others have also turned to her for guidance on the social era. So with both feet firmly planted on the side of action, Please welcome to the stage, Nilifer Merchant. Thanks, welcome. The first time I met Steve Jobs, I was in a conference room that felt a lot like this. It was much smaller in actual size, but the sense that there was like this huge gap between me and the other group was definitely there. And it was one of those long vertical conference rooms. And I was on one side with the crew of people I worked with regularly. And we were waiting for Steve to come and present. It was the year where he was doing the comeback. And everyone had heard of him, but I had only been there in the years when he was gone, the bad years, as people refer to it in the Apple era, the Gil Emilio, John Scully watched the stock price go from hundreds of dollars down to 250. You could buy a cup of coffee cheaper than you could uh, buy. I mean, you could buy an Apple stock cheaper than you could buy a cup of coffee. And so there I was, and waiting for him to come in, and really ready for this presentation. I had worked all night and put on sort of a navy blue suit with the little bow tie. Sorry to date myself there, but just super ready. And in walks Steve with his jeans and flip-flops, which by the way, really need to be th thrown away every year. They don't need to belong for 20 years, but no one had told him that story yet. And his logo t-shirt, scruffy as all get out, and sits on that end of the table. And these are the very first words that Steve Jobs ever said to me, and I think gonna set the direction for how you do innovation from now on. So I share this using his words, not mine. Behind me was a slide that said channel development, something like that, channel strategy, because that was the role that I had just been doing for the last 18 months and grown the business from $2 million to $180 million. The team asked me to be the one to present it because I was the one who was really responsible for this program. So, you know, good 50% growth, 50% uh, margin, huge growth. You be the one to represent our division as Steve come, does the business review. And so there I was very appropriate, and Steve's first words. Remember the slide, what does the slide say behind me? Channel, channel development, something like that, channel strategy. Fuck the channel. <laughs> I had this look on my face like, turning to my team sort of like, do you stop now, do you sit down? I was 20 something years old, I just had never been in such an occasion. I imagine it's a lot like what working with Elon Musk is like. There's certain moments where you're, you know, just sort of both mesmerized and terrified at the same time. But in that moment, I learned more about innovation than I had at any other point in my career. And I've drawn back on that experience now many years later to understand what was actually going on. Steve was looking at exactly the same reports that I was looking at. Things that said that the consumer wanted to get closer to the brand, that resellers and retailers weren't going to be as relevant going forward, and that something was going to disrupt this space. And I had figured out actually how to shore up those resellers, how to make them more effective, how to make them better at their job, hence the growth numbers. And he was looking at it and saying, no, you do not actually get to the future by fixing the past, right? You get to the future by inventing the future, by running towards it. And the dilemma I remember at the moment was thinking, well, then I'm out of a job. And in fact, I ended up going back to my office that day after that presentation. You can kind of picture the mood I might have been in. 
uh, and typing back an email to someone who had offered me a startup opportunity in Silicon Valley at a little company called Go Live that Adobe later bought in the first web authoring software space. So I was like, OK, time to answer this email and say, yes, I'm very interested in talking to you further. <laughs> And a couple months later, I'm at the next Macworld and talking about my product, and, and I ran into the guy who had taken over my program. I'm like, oh, how you do it? And I'm expecting to do a sympathy, you know, like, oh, do you have another job? You know, oof, you know. And actually, he's like, oh, the program's doing great. Doing exactly what you set out to do, executing on the plan. I'm like, huh, that makes no sense to me. Would it make sense to you? So here's this really bold vision about the future that we must run towards it. But in reality, it was also about managing today. And I think this is actually the truth of how innovation actually happens. You have to figure out how to manage today's business and invent the future. And I think sometimes we think, oh, it's either this or that. It's either today's business or we cannibalize it. And, we, and it's actually both. And living in that duality is part of what I want to talk to you about today. The duality of what it means to lead in modern times an existing organization, but also get us ready and prepared and armed for the future. And so in that moment, he taught me more about how to invent the future or reinvent the marketplace than any other experience I've had since. And I've worked at a ton of companies since. And one was, to look at the things that were coming towards you and don't ignore them, to actually just go, you know, that's probably directionally correct. Some of you might be parents, and this will probably resonate as much in your professional role as personal, but the whole notion that the days are long and the years are short. The same is true for innovation. When Tesla started, some of the ideas that they were talking about seemed so insanely big that everyone was like, yeah, like never going to happen, right? The days are long, the years are short. You saw a timeline of 10 years of progression from initial concept to now what they're able to do in terms of innovation. And they would not have accomplished that if they hadn't been willing to actually just look around the corner and go directionally, that's probably correct, and we'll figure out the rest as we go. And the second is to actually be willing and able to unlearn the thing you already know to be true. Because the thing that makes any one of us strong operational leaders is we know a bunch of stuff. And we're super good at what we do today. Why would you not want to be stronger at the thing you're good today? But in order for us to get ready for the future, we have to always be looking at what's that belief system, what's that understanding, what's that business construct that I have accepted as truth that is no longer necessary and important for us going forward. And the third is to actually look at all this stuff about the world and how it's changing and not go, is it really going to change? But to go, probably yes. And then it's not a question of if we are ready, but how will we be ready? So that's what I want to spend today talking about. Now, when I say the word social, what comes to mind? Media. So do me a favor, for the next minute, act social for me. Act social. All right. So what did you guys do when you were social? The, the light is in my eyes, by the way. So if I, if I do this, it's not, I'm just trying to make sure I see a larger uh, frame than just the few tables up in front. What was social like? Somebody tell me what just happened at this table. Dialogue. Dialogue. Other things that happened. What's social? Connecting. I heard something and then I couldn't hear the rest of it, so. Say it again. <laughs> You're being too social, you can't repeat it. What else? Participating. Participating, excuse me. I'm on like three and a half hours of sleep. If I sound at all goofy, ignore me. What else? Listening. Listening. Thank you. Anybody ask any questions? Anybody actually touch each other? Like shake hands? And Tess came over to me and she goes, let me be social by actually Facebooking with you right now. And I thought that was just perfect. 
high-fiving, maybe hug, not a hugging crowd. Financial industry, not a hugging crowd. So, the thing when I mean social is all of that, right? What do human beings, what have we been doing since we were first in creation? We understand how to connect. We understand how to first meet each other, how to get to know each other, and hopefully over time develop trust with one another so that we ultimately make things with each other. Humans are so pronounced in their ability to learn from each other. That's why we actually don't literally recreate the wheel. We learn from our historical past, and that's what the first 10 years of a child's relationship is actually to learn everything the way it works so that they don't have to repeat that lesson. So social is all of that. It is not the thing where you're staring at a device walking around like this. Especially not taking like the mobile device into a you know, bathroom or something. It is not any of that. And so when I talk about social with you guys, I want to talk about how to bring that into everyday life at scale. Because that's the thing we always worry about, right? Is that we're at a conference room and at this table, we can say hello, we can look each other in the eye, we can actually make a connection. But at scale, oh boy, it doesn't work. And so that's why we go to other methods. And we start treating things more like marketing, more like talking at people, because we think that's what scale is about. And I'm going to hopefully convince you that social can actually scale in a very different way. It just requires a different unlearning and a new process to learn something new. Let me tell you about how Ted did something that was incredibly social and created scale. So Ted, many years ago, now most of you probably know of Ted the conference, but just in case, Ted stands for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. It was once a conference where about 1,500, 1,800 people got together in a room. It was the Bill Gates and Steve Jobs of the world, and Elon actually goes, and, uh, and in one conference room had people develop their best ideas and share them in an 18-minute menu. And at one point, about six or seven years ago, the idea was, well, since we're already having super smart ideas, well-created, well-drafted, why not videotape them? Why not share them? That made sense. And then at some point, they said, you know, maybe there are other people who have ideas worth sharing, because that's the theme of TED. Maybe there are other people who have ideas worth sharing that do not belong at an $8,500 conference. <whistles> right? And maybe in other parts of the world with other talent. But, and I happened to be in the room when this conversation happened. And the way it, it you know, the conversation sort of came, sort of like, um, if you guys remember Romper Room, it was like looking through the little mirror glass and going, and David and Jane and Michael will be interested. Because it was literally like looking around the room saying, I think three or five of you might be interested and we're going to go ahead and give you permission. And we're going to call this thing TEDx, so it's a derivative. X stands for your city, your interest. And from that place, you will be able to figure out what ideas matter to you. Can't charge for it. And the original sort of guidelines were really just guidelines. It was 10 bullet points. Go. And since then, over 6,000 of events have been held globally, from places as nearby as Boulder, Colorado, to as far away as Kibera, which is a slum outside of Nairobi, Kenya. And in that particular story, in the one in, uh, in the slum, they actually had to bring in these portable lights like what you and I might see on the side of the roads when construction is happening in order to even be able to light the room for them to be able to film the conversation. And they asked the local politicians to come into the slums. And then they asked the people there to actually communicate what ideas matter to you. And the subject covered everything from water to sanitation to education, healthcare, so on. But local to them. And what was so remarkable is because of the platform of TED, people sitting there listened better than they were listening earlier. And they were actually able to change the policy. So a whole bunch of new things happened as a result of this moment. That's what TEDx enabled. But, and so all that's the good stuff, right? Scale. But, and what is this scale about? Is it about Ted spending money? Is it about Ted hiring a bunch of people? Is it even about necessarily a new technology? It's about social. What they said is, I will trust you to figure out what ideas matter to you 
you create from there. You do what it is you're going to go do. Now, when you do that, and I think a lot of companies, uh, you know, that kind of hear that example are like, yeah, but that's like, that's kind of scary, right? Because you're going to let somebody else now do something on your behalf. What if they mess it up? <gasps> what if something goes wrong? And that's exactly what happened at TED. So three, four, five years into it, people were actually regularly commenting about how much TED should take back the TEDx brand, that things were not going well, yada, yada. And in one particular instance, there was a conference held in Valencia, in Spain, and translated pretty fast. And it was supposed to be a conference about the science emphasis. And it was not. So like one of the talks was the healing crystal power, you know, you kind of get the point, right? So, so it, was, it was more, um, you could call it modern if you were being acceptable about that, but it was really not considered good science. And, uh, and so people were using this as yet another example of Ted's failing, and their brand is losing all its value in what they're doing. And so what Ted did at that moment is actually, I think, the real lesson in how does social play itself out. So instead of going and taking that one person behind the woodshed going, which would be, by the way, wouldn't it be your natural instinct, right? Like, you're out of here, man. That's how we're going to manage the problem. What they actually said was, you know, you're right. We do seem to have a problem here. What do you even think the problem is? And that happened first on one blog, and then over the course of almost 50 blogosphere kind of conversations, there was also a listserv conversation going on. And, and the way I ended up finding out about this sort of inadvertently was I happened to notice the initial conversation on GitHub, which is this geeky community of people ripping on this issue. And then I happened to notice that this one particular person wrote in and said, you know, it's true, there's an issue, we're going to see if we can work on it. And so I just tagged her name to see what was going on. Just like I figured if she showed up anywhere else on the web, I would find her. And she did. She literally went to these blogs that was like, you know, I, I figure like eight people are reading some of these blogs. Like no one's reading it. So she went all over. And in one of those conversations, someone said, you know, there's this, there's this paper that's been written about how to even tell the difference between good science and bad science. Maybe that would be helpful. And then that conversation got taken somewhere else saying, do you guys think that would be helpful? Is that a good frame of reference? Maybe we can adjust it to work for us. And so on. This took, by the way, several months. And I sound a little bit like a stalker in that I'm following her across the web and watching this issue. I'm not on the list for serve, but friends of mine are. So I'm like checking in. I'm like, well, how's it going? And they're saying, well, here's the thing, what we've learned, what we've learned is that it's not for Ted to tell us what it is that went wrong. It's for us to decide what is this shared thing that we signed up to when we said we believe in ideas worth sharing. So it is both their thing and our thing. So the solution, therefore, has to be what? Jointly created. And we're learning together what it's going to take. And so in the end, they ended up coming up with a much more clear set of guidelines. And, and here's the, the, the piece that's, to me, the quintessential piece that every leader would want, right? It's no longer Ted's job to monitor it. It's no longer some corporate person's job to go, It's everyone's, because what we're saying is, listen, people, we're in this together. Let's figure out how to help each other, how to improve each other's work, how to address when something goes offline. That's social at scale. Because now millions of people have attended a TEDx event, and those ideas continue to scale. Some of the best talks, actually, some of the ones you might have actually seen on TED.com have come from those smaller venues where somebody did their very best work sharing an idea they thought mattered. Could you imagine doing that? In some ways, you already do, right? What are co-ops all about? They're about an idea that we jointly believe in. But the question really is, do we allow control to exist outside the perimeter of our organization? Do we take in ideas from many places? Do we say, this is ours to address? Or do we say, no, 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 this is ours to address, like more like with this sort of, you know, dotted line around us, ours. So that's really the question I want you to think about when you think about our business here. What is it when we say it's a cooperative? And how could we actually cooperate with a lot of people to extend that idea into something much bigger?
because it wasn't about money that created that scale. It was about relationships, which, by the way, is something is incredibly scalable, but looks slow at the beginning. Looks slow at the beginning. I think that's why most people steer away from it. And then we get a chance to build something much bigger than what you or I could do, but something that each of us can do, contributing into a common. Some of the things I've just talked to you about, just in that TED story, are how much the fundamental axes have changed. Right? What granted authority to those people? Was it that they had the right education, that they were incredibly qualified, that they were videographers? No. It was their passion that gave them that ticket to play. So we've moved from asking for having the right credentials to having the right capabilities, and capabilities comes as much from here as it does just from here. Alignment doesn't happen because we all work in some one place inside one organization, but because we are drawn to a common flame. And that purpose ends up uniting us. And the accountability goes from you know, how we mostly think about accountability, meaning I assign you a budget, and then you spend the budget, and then you come back and check in with me, and I'll give you more budget if you did what you said you were going to do, right? Those are all the routine mechanisms that we have around managing business today. It becomes much more relational, which is, you figure it out. Super creative people, go figure it out. And then when we get stuck, we'll figure it out together. And it allows you to do something really quite different. This changes how we compete in the marketplace. The original Latin of the word compete is to seek together. It has been highly distorted in modern economic times to, be, to, to compete against each other instead of to seek together. And so we have to go back to an economic frame that is much more inclusive. And let's just think about what that could mean. There are times when being big is certainly going to matter a lot. But in most situations, when it's not capital intensive, silicon intensive, then it's about connectedness. It's about that moment we just had, but more so. So that the gorilla to gazelles might be the metaphor. That it used to be that the 800 pound gorilla won by being dominant in the space. And the gazelles win by being able to signal to each other. When my husband and I went on honeymoon, we went to Africa and we were doing these safari visits. Have any of you guys ever been so lucky to do one of those? If you ever do, it's an incredible experience because you wake up ridiculously early and then, you know, without coffee or anything, you go sit in a Jeep and you ride out to the savanna and you wait because all the noise you just created has disrupted the environment. So now you have to sit really quietly for a long time so the animals return. And the first ones that come on the savanna are the gazelles. And they come looking like they are one and two three and four. They look completely disconnected. And yet when the prey animal comes, the gazelles are the ones who trigger to each other faster than any other animal. And they signal. So one goes down, but the other 999 escape really well. Right? And if you notice, that's actually what needs to happen in the marketplace. It's no longer about dominating over a space, but about being able to leap from opportunity to opportunity with that kind of speed and agility to be able to signal to one another hey, here's what we need next. So it's that highly connected sense that we're in this together, and that, but we operate on different parts of the terrain. And in the marketplace, it's been proven now that the things that used to be called competitive advantages don't exist anymore. Rita McGrath, a Columbia professor, talks about how that arc used to be 40 years. She used to be able to sort of stake out a turf, be able to say, this is mine for 40 years, and now, in slow-moving industry, that's down to 12. In fast-moving industries, which, by the way, you're in a fast-moving industry, is down to five. So just enough time to stake out, here's what we should go do next, get maybe good at it, and then move on to the next thing. You're leaping from opportunity to opportunity now. Anything that's information-based is going to be affected by this, which just about everything is. Now, a lot of organizations are thinking about this like, like spandex. Like if I just sort of suck it in, I'll look thinner for a moment kind of thing. 
That's what all the cost cutting is about when you think about it organizationally, right? Like if I just get everyone to go a little faster and with a little bit less money, then suddenly I'll be acting like a gazelle. No, it's going to require you to unlearn some things that you take for granted when you're the gorilla that you have to actually really think about what does a gazelle do differently. And this is the thing that we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes, right? Relationships are, to the social era, what efficiency was to the industrial era. All that fun that we can have together, all that joy, all that ability to actually help one another. It's what people do naturally. We just don't necessarily do that at business. We leave that stuff at the door, and now we can actually bring it in. When I wrote my second book, the one that we had talked about, The 11 Rules for Creating Value, I actually spent a lot of time thinking about the banking industry in specific, about why they were failing. And it was everything from when Bank of America was doing that charge to be able to get your own money back, right? And how much sort of mayhem happened out of that, and they had to undo it. But it's also about the fact that Bitcoin is an entirely different framework for thinking about the financial industry. And then I think about myself, like, I'm now living in France. I have bank accounts in the US. Um, I have one bank account in Europe. I can't even figure out where to get a check deposited there because it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me that I have a physical location. I am, you know, tech, I, from my perspective, I'm like, a bank is my app. I don't need anything else. Periodically, though, when I want to talk to someone, I want somebody to really know what the answer is, right? And so it changes how we think about what is this thing we're actually doing. And so it's not, therefore, about doing the same thing that we did yesterday faster, which is what efficiency would be, but to think about what are people really needing today, and then how do we serve that, which is a very different way of thinking about work, very different way of thinking about competing. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes just doing a click down on how we might rethink the three parts of that as leaders, so get really operational. So one is, what is your role as a leader for the individual? What is your role then as an us? So you, us, and together is where I'm going. And then what do we do as you know, an organizational frame? The first thing is that we have to accept that anyone can participate. Not that everyone will, but that anyone can. Now, most of us are still looking forward. Does that person have the right credentials? Do they have the right fit within our organization? But that rules out a bunch of talent. Because sometimes talent doesn't look like what you expect it to look like. And sometimes it's the idea that's sitting right inside your organization that you largely don't pay any attention to. So for example, uh, there was a woman who had been studying, uh, you know, managing a portfolio from Morgan Stanley and had been studying what really drove growth. And over and over again, for almost 10 years, she had seen research by a whole bunch of very reputable firms prove that if you had three or more women on a board, the performance of that company is, I think, 24% higher on an ROE perspective than other organizations. And she had seen the data repeated in so many different places in so many different ways that she was pretty sure this could form an investment strategy. But she looked around at her firm that did not look at all like what that data would suggest, and she was thinking, mm, they really don't want to hear that idea from me. And so for years, she didn't say anything until finally she was like, well, I'm either going to do it here or I'm going to take it somewhere else. And she went to her company with that pitch of like, this is what I think we can do. I think we can actually build a portfolio based on a strategy of women board members. Of course, it doesn't mean everyone's in. We still use judgment, but let's do that. It's on its third year. You can look her up, parity portfolio. The numbers are amazing. What if she had never brought that idea to the table? Now, as a leader, how do you actually allow that? Because the thing is, sometimes we don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. She saw it for an incredibly long time, but she didn't feel she had the permission at her firm to bring it to bear. So what can you do as a leader of your organization to actually say, you know what, every idea, no matter what it is, because it comes from you, has some value. That each of you has something to contribute, even if it doesn't look like what I think it's going to look like. Because that's actually where, by the way, all innovation happens. It doesn't look like what we think it's going to look like. Why? Because it's the future. It, and it, you know, I love the people who always say, go chase a really big idea. And like a big idea actually looks so small at the beginning because no one else sees it. So counterintuitive. You make it big by seeing it. You become it. You do it. And that's what makes it big. 
So when we actually acknowledge that who we are is what we make, then you actually try to figure out how to draw on the talent of each of the people in the room. And I have a word for this that I've been using because I've been trying to compare it to prior times. In history, it used to be that machines were really important to create wealth, so you know, the cotton gin. Didn't matter who the person was, lost your arm, didn't matter, find another person with an arm. Then there was a time when it was just about shoving things through a pipeline, so how many people do we have on that pipeline? Then it was about how much money did people have, so do we have the capital structure? And today it is about the idea resident in the person. So I call this thing onlyness, that each of us is standing in a spot in the world only you're standing in. It's a function of your history and experiences, visions and hopes. And it's from that place where all new ideas come from. And that means that every single person has an idea. Whether or not that fits with your idea is different. Right, because you might only be looking for the things you expect to see, but all newness is going to come from onlyness. Anyone, quite possibly everyone, can count. Even the unexpected ones. Even the ones you're not listening to today. And so your job as a leader is to figure out how to invite everyone to play at the table. Back when I was doing consulting, I used to ask, um, you know, we used to do big turnaround situations, like huge, like companies failing, $4 billion kind of problems, like huge. And they had typically hired a McKinsey or a Bain or somebody like that beforehand, then they had, or they had tried it themselves for a while, so usually they had failed a couple of times before they got to us. And our whole thing was we would manage the process. And of course, there wasn't a leader around who wouldn't say, sure, you can manage the process, because who the hell wants to manage the process? Right? And one of the first things that we would do is ask that leader to write out an email to everyone in the organization pretty broadly and say, anyone who wants to come help solve this problem, come. And the leader would always look at me, CEO of a major, you know, billion, blah, blah, blah company, look at me, and I swear to God, it took me years to figure out what the look was, but it was a lot like that look I was giving to Steve Jobs, you know, it was a look like, are you kidding me? Right? What just happened here? And I think they were mostly looking at their CFO, like, can we cancel that PO? Can we, you know, get out of this thing? Because there's no way I'm writing an email to all the crazy people who might show up. Because that's what they're so afraid of. Aren't you afraid of that? Like, aren't you afraid of what will happen if you ask everyone to come help you? Right? I said, no, no, we're going to make sure they manage against the guidelines. That's going to be the safety rails. But we're going to invite everyone. Because the reason you failed isn't because people are stupid. It's because you don't understand the problem well enough together. And you don't, therefore, have ownership of what the solution needs to be. If that group comes up with a shared understanding of the problem, and they end up coming up with a shared understanding of the solution, you will cross a finish line at the biggest level. At the smallest level, I'm going to give you a piece of research to take back. Even when you're wrong, even when that person's idea is stupid, truly stupid, it still improves the quality of the overall decision making to the tune of 30%. So even if you don't view this as the whole like, oh my gosh, I can actually use this as a way to close the gap between strategy and execution, which is, by the way, what my first book is about, even if I don't think about it as how do I think about scale really bigger, at the most minimal level, think about how do you invite everyone to participate in shaping an idea to be better? Because even if they're wrong, it will help you as a leader. Us. When Ryan Andreessen was uh, just about to leave the Boy Scouts and, and try to earn the highest award you can earn in the Boy Scouts, he filled out all the paperwork, he had done his service project, but his den leader wouldn't meet with him. And after trying very repeatedly, he was like, oh, there must be something wrong, I'm gonna get my dad involved, dad gets involved, goes and meets with the den leader and finds out that Ryan cannot receive an Eagle Scout award. And the reason that the den leader gave was, I wish Ryan had lied to me about the fact that he was gay. Because he's gay, our policy in the Boy Scouts is he cannot receive an Eagle Scout award. And the dad, knowing how much this is going to break Ryan's heart, Ryan was this kid that when he was little, he used to wear the Boy Scout outfit underneath his pajamas and button him all, you know, the pajamas all the way up so the outfit was hidden underneath, thinking that that would fool his mom. He loved the Boy Scouts, so he was devastated when he had worked basically all his life up to that moment to earn this word of honor and was told no. Because of who you are, you cannot get it. 
And he ended up connecting up with other people through this platform called change.org. And the other people said, no, 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 Ryan, you don't have to give up who you are because we believe in you. And when Ryan first filled out the application, his mom actually helped him because he was too young. And he basically said, Ryan did a anti-bullying project when he was young and uh, really believes in having this, you know, supporting all people and this is not fair. And Ryan thought, well, his dad and mom and maybe like a couple friends from church and, you know, some other people would kind of help him. So he was thinking like 50 signatures would be good. At change.org, what happens is you get an email every time somebody fills out a petition. So the person on the receiving end gets an email. So this guy, you know, Ryan's thinking he's going to get 50 emails basically saying, what you're doing is not right. You should give Ryan the award. Well, it turns out this story caught fire because a lot of people believe that this was an injustice. And he was able to connect with those people online. And together, over 150,000 emails got delivered to this poor guy. And the Boy Scouts actually changed their entire national policy. And so this is Ryan with his Eagle Scout Award. And what he was saying is, I will not be defined by what you say, because he, he was being asked, you can either be a Boy Scout or you can be gay. But in claiming all of him, his onlyness, he actually found a way to change the world. Because he found the other people who shared in his convictions and together became much more powerful as a result. And so that's what ends up being an idea each of us can take back to work. Instead of saying, you know, you do this job because you're in this box, you now do this thing because we're deeply, deeply connected in a shared role. When people play on a team, what allows them to play well together, to play position, is not because they understand the position, but because they trust what's going to happen when they kick the ball a certain place. They trust who is going to do what. And if we could actually change our relationships at work to be more focused on trust and less focused on who is in the box and the box of the job, then we would actually figure out a way to have a really profoundly different relationship with work. And one team I was working with, because now I get a chance to do workshops with teams like this, so I, I might take a presentation like this, but spend a day with the team. And we were talking about this idea of trust, and they came up with this analogy, and, and I borrow it now. And they said, you know, we treat our work like the babysitter and not the parent. Now, how many of you guys have hired babysitters? Just about everybody, right? Come on. Hands up if you've hired a babysitter. What's the babysitter's job? <laughs> to keep the kid alive. <laughs> to keep the kid alive. Is it to care whether or not the kid ate healthy that day, got their homework done, got enough sleep so they'd be able to pay attention at school? No. What's the parent's job? To care, right? Long beyond the specific and to figure out how to invest in this much fuller person. And so this team was saying, you know, we treat our work like we're the babysitter, meaning it didn't die on my watch, right? I did this part, it was yours, it died on your watch. And, uh, and even divorced parents, so that was the best part of the analogy, even divorced parents managed to figure out how to get along for the sake of the kid, why can't we? And they learned how to have a really different construct and a different communication. And the reason that analogy wasn't important wasn't that I came in and said trust is important, right? It was that they came to their own metaphor, their own understanding, their own conversation, and that's the way in which they're now going to refer to each other, babysitter or parent, babysitter or parent. What would be the metaphor your team would come up with if you had this conversation? How would you guys bring that home? This thing that they're talking about, the babysitter or the parent, is to say, why are we here? Purpose brings out the very best in people and the best people. And quite often, we're not aligning against purpose. Although I would argue in the co-op industry, probably a lot of people work for you because they do believe in your purpose. But how much do you amplify that? Besides day one, when they show up and believe, what do you do every day to say, this is why we're here. Now, what can we do? And the third piece, is about how do we lead? How do we think about this thing of togetherness? How do we take this into a new level? And some of it can start with what we've already been doing. I, I actually went and looked at the Open IDEO project that's been going on, and I know you guys are gonna spend some more time on that. 
the Think Prize. So some of it can be about how do we invite people to have their best ideas? How do we get those ideas on the table? Beautiful illustration of it, right? Because everyone has an idea, and if they can contribute it and maybe see each other's ideas, they can figure out how to build off of it. Imagine doing that back at your work. How do you build a culture where everybody wants to bring their best idea? Culture is the, the things that hold the stars in the sky. You know, in space, what you often see is the stars and the planets, but everything that's holding it into the place is invisible to us. That's what culture is to our organization. It is the invisible force that allows everything to be connected. And so you as a leader need to really think about what is it that we're doing? Are we focused on who's in what box, which is that's quite often how we're thinking about it, right? So-and-so has authority because there's so-and-so person in such and such box of such and such office, and this is the reporting structure, and this is this person's title, and that's who's gonna make the decision. Instead of actually thinking and realizing, by the way, that we don't fail today in business because people don't do their individual things. That's not why we fail. We fail not because the people in the boxes fail, but because of the gaps between the boxes. We fail because we leave an air sandwich inside our organization where the top tells the bottom what to do, and what's left, just like out of any good sandwich, is all the stuff that matters. The conversations, the understanding, the shared intent. As long as we have an air sandwich in the business, we fail. What is the way in which we say to people, you know what, we're gonna do something together. It's the work I was doing when I was doing transformative stuff, right? As I was getting people in the same room, quite literally, sometimes virtually and stuff, to say, what is that thing we want? And then how might we both get there? And by the way, there is no one right answer. We have to start holding open the possibility that there are many right truths. And that's how we start to fill in the air sandwich, because that team that comes together and fixes it does so because they felt heard, and now they hurt each other. And then when they're in execution mode, they know, who do they need to check back in with? They don't need to check back in with you, right? They need to just know, what are, what are we all doing? What position are we all playing? Where are we going? Where's the net? And your job as a leader, the number one thing you can do to be a better leader is to listen. Anyone want a trick on knowing how to do that? No? Okay, I'll move right along. No, really, 40% variance in leadership. The, the only variable larger in leadership is whether or not someone is competent. So, you know, do you not drool at your job is the first basic level, and for a minute, I'm gonna assume you all have that. So then the biggest influence you can have is listening. But how many of us go into meetings looking to listen? When was the last time you actually made a list of questions before you went into a meeting? Most of us make a list of what facts we're gonna share, what information needs to be distributed, what kind of, right? So do this thing. Next meeting you have, even the next session we're gonna have, think about what questions do I hope to have answered in this session? And then when you go to the next meeting, what questions could I ask to learn more? I'm hoping, by the way, that this tees up a great conversation uh, for the Think It Out session that we're going to do later on together because I'm going to get a chance to talk with you more. But to sit there and go, okay, how do I actually learn to listen? It's to actually pose things as questions and to become incredibly competent at that. When you listen loudly, that's what I've been talking about all this morning. What Ted did was listen loudly to newness, to difference, to the voices of onlyness, and what they gained as an advantage was an ability to adapt. What you do when you connect with one another is to listen well. And when you hear a new idea that doesn't fit inside your frame, you don't just dismiss it out of hand, but to say, what could that be for us? And how could we take this home? So this is not about if, this is about how. And I'm gonna show you how all this fits together into one mathematical equation. Because some people think about this people stuff as being the soft stuff. Do you guys think about that as being the soft stuff? Like Tesla is all about technology, right? But the way in which they're actually making everything they're doing is driven off the same formula I'm about to share today. Guarantee it. I, don't, I haven't been inside their plant. I guarantee this is what they're doing now. Their success is a function of talent times purpose raised to the power of culture. That's what I've just finished talking to you about. Let me just show you what that means. So if you have a small amount of talent, sorry, 
see if the side will actually build. If you have a small amount of talent, but that group is highly connected, you will get one performance. If you have a really, really talented group, and some of you have been a part of that group where you're like so super talented, but not aligned in purpose, you also get diminished, right? It doesn't, it doesn't create anything bigger than what you individually bring. But you start getting a modicum of both. You start to see a growth factor. And then you put them in a culture that diminishes them. They shrink. All their ideas are left off the table. And then if you actually figure out how to bring it in to work, a culture that actually invites everyone to play, everyone to be purposefully aligned, everyone to come and help us compete in the marketplace, for us to seek together who will we be and how will we win and how will we be awesome at that, then all of a sudden you have the kind of velocity that creates the kind of performance that we can only dream about today. So with that, I want to leave you with this. The future can be smaller or it can be exponentially bigger based on how we treat the talent we have, grow with purpose, and the culture that we can each bring. And we can look into the future and run towards it at a glimpse of the things that we're all talking about at this conference today and figure out how to create the future that we all know is possible. Because the future is not created, the future is co-created. Thank you. Wow. You know, it's, it's funny. I was, I was, when, when we did the, uh, the poll earlier and the, the question, I had to bring it up, uh, what's the biggest challenge to meet increased consumer expectations? And the options were executive team, communication, and lack of collaboration. And the choice that from, from the audience here was communication. And when I talked about that, I think I automatically assumed communication outside of the organization. And what you're talking about here is that the change has to start inside. And Ivan even was talking about this last night, that a lot of the change has to start here with the culture. And, it starts and, here. And I, you know, when, when you, yeah, exactly. When, when you talk about social, here. yeah. I think we all think of social as being so external right. to customers, to fans, whatever it is. And it's not. Right. It's not exclusively, at least. Right. It's about how do we listen, right? Yeah. And, and the thing is, I, actually, I saw that quiz, and I, I was like, that's like a false choice. I actually had that. Uh, I feel like it's a false choice, because sometimes we think communication is separate from our executive and leadership stuff, or communication. No, communication is everything we do. It's, a, it's inherently, it's the, it's the alphabet soup of leadership, right? Mm -hmm. And so to the degree that we're listening, which is the biggest part of communication, as the research clearly shows, how much are we actually listening to new ideas? How much are we allowing those ideas to be built by other people? Because sometimes we can dampen the effort of our own people. And how do we invite people to come, bring out the very best of themselves? That's just such a huge shift. And, and I'll tell you, the generation that's following me, that's what they're motivated by. And it, because they know that the other model doesn't work, right? So now they're seeing it. And they're going to be the ones, I think, that force us, old yes. parts, to change. Yeah. No, I, I, I know that from when I was in a newsroom. And we'd have you know, people in their 20s coming up. and their expectations of how the place was supposed to run and how they were supposed to be treated and what they were supposed to be doing and how fast they were supposed to be promoted and everything is completely, like completely different from, uh, from what I grew up with and certainly, you know, the generation before me. And you me. probably had to unlearn some things. Some oh, things, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Which is yeah. hard, right, at first? It's very hard. Because everyone yeah. likes the idea of change, but no one likes to actually change. Yeah. Like, that's the reality. <laughs> All right, well, we will talk more, yes. much more about this. Thank Fantastic. you so much. It's great.